thank you for being here. Uh, if you don't know me, but know Dr. Fine, you know I'm not him, but uh, Dr. Fine sends his regrets. He's had a loss in the family, so he's not been able to be with us last night or this morning. Uh, he loves these sessions. He loves engaging with you, uh, so I know it's hard on him professionally both and personally, but he sends his regrets. I'm Kyle Smith. I'm the treasurer of the district. I'd like to welcome a few of our team members here tonight. We've got, or this morning, we've got uh, Steve and Amy from Perkins and Will. We've got Amelia from Moody Nolan. Uh, we have board member Dr. Baker. Uh, board President, Miss Victoria Powers. Um, we were going to have some administrators here this morning, but uh, maybe you'll hear from your kids later. We've got some testing issues, uh, so they're not able to be with us, and that's important for that they stay in our buildings with our kids. Um, not our issues, but the state issues. So uh, that might be important to know. Uh, you'll hear from uh, our members from Perkins and Will and Doc, Dr. Williams a little bit later here. Um, here's our agenda for this morning. Uh, this is Community Engagement Session 3, our Learning uh, Environment sum Summit. Uh, if you've not been with us before, here's a, a quick uh, brief summary of, of how we got here, why we're here today. About a year ago, the district finished a strategic plan, uh, an initiative with three goals of culture, teaching and learning and facilities, and a fourth goal of diversity, equity, and inclusion, encompassing all three of these areas. Uh, within that, the facilities goal is to develop a, a district facilities plan that will efficiently utilize spaces and resources to address the growing population involving needs of the district and, most importantly, our students. Uh, so some dis uh, district planning facts, no decisions have been made. Uh, that's why we are engaging with you to get feedback and working on options. And there are no zero cost options. As a treasurer, I can guarantee you there's no zero cost options. Residential and commercial structures are very different. Um, we're going to present to the board tonight a $600,000 uh, roof replacement on a section of Maryland. We have to do that now. We can't wait to do that. Uh, the board will make that decision tonight. And that's just a section. Our own homes might be 20,000 or so. Um, very different. And, and we need to hear from you. If, if we heard from you before, thank you. We need you engaged throughout this process. We know it's a commitment and we recognize that and thank you for it. Um, and we are open to a transparent process. Um, we, we have a lot of information on our website about this. You can always provide feedback uh, through our website continuously. If you think of something in the middle of the afternoon, if you're walking by a building and you have a thought, we would love to hear from you. So you can always reach out to us um, through our facilities planning website. Uh, a quote from Dr. Or from John Dewey, Dr. Fine really wanted me to share this with you, uh, so I will read it so I don't mess it up. If we teach today's students as we did yesterday, then we are robbing them their tomorrow. Sit with that for a second. As Dr. Williams comes up, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for being here again today. I just have a few slides that I'd like to share with you today. Um, first slide here is a kind of an overview of the process, a little visual. And I want to emphasize that we are now wrapping up phase one. Today will be the, basically almost the end of phase one. And the report will be generated and shared with the community and the Board of Education after this session. There have been a lot of data points gathered um, through different ways and venues and, and studies done in our buildings. So that we've had a, a very thorough process in that phase one. We're moving into the options phase. And the options phase you'll see our building team members will come up start developing some possible options for each of our sites that will be considered. And that could be a range of things from repairs to renovate to rebuild they'll, they'll have or do nothing. They could have, we'll be looking all the data making some options decisions based on that and that will occur April through October. Follow up with the core team will start making, looking at that, making some decisions and making recommendations to the Board of Education in December. I want to emphasize again how important community engagement is through this process. This is, uh, this is our community. These are our schools. 
and we need a lot of input and uh, feedback so that we're making sure we're making the best decision for our students and they give us the best and have, have mo this, this, the community most excited about this process. And no preconceived solutions. I want to reiterate that again. I've, I've had a couple times when somebody after these meetings say, hey, Harley, there's a lean. I heard someone say this during the building team meetings. And yeah, we have, we have taken every idea Every idea that people bring up, we, we look at, oh, there's not like a bad idea as we go through this process. And so, just, and sometimes these ideas will actually contradict themselves. Someone might say something and someone else says something that contradicts. That doesn't mean that there's a lean. I, and I, and I want to make sure that those of you who don't know me, that I'm, I've, I've always been honest and maybe to a fault sometimes. I, 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 I'm honest and there is not a lean, I, I promise you. Uh, and as Kyle mentioned, um, we, have, we have maintenance issues still. Our buildings look great because of our maintenance plan. And, and John Eikenberry does a great job with that. We can't wait on some of the things. We have over 32 sections of roof. We have to keep the maintenance set schedule. At least we feel we have to. Ultimately it's always a board decision, but we have a maintenance plan that we follow. <coughs> Guiding principles, I want to just leave that up for about two seconds here. These will come back up when Amy speaks and she'll, she'll cover those. I said earlier we have a lot of data points. Well, we get we, we had surveys, we've had forums, we, they met with student body at the middle, middle school students and high school students and got a lot of feedback about what they want to see in the rooms. We had our building team meetings last week and we uh, incorporated this Miro Tech Board, this online tool to collect a lot of data points. It's a fantastic tool, but I just want to show that to you, how, it, how, how we engage 40 some people on a Zoom call to get information and feedback. And I'll share with you some of the data and feedback. So what we have known so far based on this is that we had three questions that we asked them. The first question, what ways are facilities failing to meet the expectations? All right. And so what you'll see if you look across the board, each of the building teams, we see some similarities. These were the emerging themes. These weren't all ideas. Like I said, some ideas that were put up were actually in, in contradiction to some of these, but these were the ones that came across the most often. And you'll see, you know, natural light become an issue for a lot of buildings across tight, small classrooms. You'll see accessibility. You'll see cafeteria. That the, the, the themes are not hidden. I mean, the issues that we have are not really hidden to our community. <clears throat> and they, and they, uh, they found themselves onto this page here. And so we ask them, the next, the next question is, what changes need to occur? Well, once you have a problem, you usually go to the opposite to fix the problem. So we need more light. We need larger classrooms. We need a bigger cafeteria. We need more athletic spaces. Things like that uh, kind of permeated uh, on that. No surprises there based on what we saw on the first slide. And then the, the big question we were asking because not only we need to know, our architects need to know what is it that we value? What is it that whatever the process you do, whatever project you do, this has to stay the same. And we looked at it both in the terms of a district, as a district school facilities, and we also looked at it as buildings. And so some of the things that came across as far as um, our non-negotiables, that, that we want this to stay the way it is, the, the most common themes were neighborhood walking schools, but historical buildings, in, in, in particular Montrose, the facade of Montrose, the facade of High School, and Cassingham came across as um, things that we thought were non-negotiable. We, we, we'd like to keep them here if possible. And as you can go through there, that we like our theaters, uh, neighborhood walking schools came across, pretty common throughout as a walkable community. Um, and I don't think, I think, you know, but I do want to say, just because these were the emergencies, please don't think that all, all ideas are being considered and options will probably come across and give us a lot of different options. And then there'll be a time and process where we'll see which of these options hold the most traction. So uh, if someone brings up an idea, it doesn't mean there's a lean. We're, we're just exploring everything. Because the one thing I don't want to have said at the end of this process is that, well, you, 
you didn't even consider our idea. You didn't consider it. And I don't think that would, for me, it's the process I want to be perfect. Not, not, and I want the outcome to be perfect too, but I really want the, the process to be, as we said it would, transparent and open. And so with that, I like that we've already introduced our team, so I'll turn it over right now to our architect from Perkins and Will, uh, Steve Turks. Thank you, Dr. Williams. <clears throat> Good morning. Okay, we call this session the Learning Environment Summit. Um, really, it's just to begin to introduce some ideas about uh, how other schools across the country, and you'll see a couple, um, maybe not labeled, but in other countries, have dealt and grappled with similar ideas. I'm going to share some um, of, the, of the why reasons why our clients are looking at changing facilities, and then Amy's going to take you through part two which is just a, a quick visual survey of a bunch of schools from around the country and a, and a couple that are abroad. Uh, in between those two, at the end of, at, at the end of my session or my, my little presentation, you've got some sheets already in front of you. If you don't have one, there are hopefully more available out front. If you don't have them, don't get up. We'll, we'll get those to you at the right time. We're going to have you uh, answer the first two questions after I speak and then the last two after Amy speaks. And we want to encourage you to either write those out on the sheets that you have or there's a QR code on there. And I would uh, uh, vote for you to do the QR code if you can because that records it electronically for us. It actually saves us one step from having to transcribe things, which we would appreciate. Do it either way you want to. The important thing is that we collect the information, okay? Uh, so the first two after I speak, the second two after Amy speaks. Uh, let's get going here. <clears throat> I'd love to start off with this quote from Einstein. At least it's attributed to him. We can't solve our problems with the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Right? We have to allow ourselves to think a little bit differently, perhaps, uh, about uh, uh, the path of the school facilities going forward. And also uh, wanted to share this, just as a thing to consider, uh, a th a maybe a thought provoker. In the year 2060, a child whose parents are not yet born will attend Bexley City Schools. This child will likely not know you, us, or others who created the district facilities plan and the vision for their, their edu uh, educational experience. Right, so just trying to get us, our mindset, to think, be thinking about the future here. Um, <clears throat> The, if, you, if you gauge uh, by the historic nature of the schools that you have today, it's very likely right, that whatever the solution, the outcome here is, whatever gets implemented will still be in place when this child walks through the doors of those schools. Right? If, you, if you gauge by what you have today and how long it's lasted you. So it's an important task. Who's going to be walking through your doors today? Uh, it's Gen Alpha. Right? They're the first uh, generation born wholly within this century, right? They don't know a world where they can't grab a device and get instant access to information, right? So it really sort of changes the landscape of, you know, where, is the, where does knowledge sit today? Uh, and, it, and what's certainly true, what we think, is that um, there's been no time in human history where we've, we have, where we've seen change happening faster than we, than we do today. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. If we, think, if we look at other industries, it's sometimes fun for us to sort of get out of our world of working on schools and what's happening in other, in other industries. In aviation, uh, you know, the golden age of aviation sort of grew up <clears throat> after World War II when, you know, everybody was flying around on prop airplanes and you had these sort of luxurious accommodations in, inside your airplane, right? We had lots of leg room and uh, nice, you know, nice food and cocktails that would be delivered to you. Not the case today, certainly. But certainly, uh, airports and, uh, and airplanes have changed dramatically. Uh, the, the, the Boeing uh, Dreamliner here was introduced a couple of years ago, and uh, Boeing's been in the news recently, not, not in a good way, right? <laughs> Pieces of airplanes keep falling off, it seems. Um, but this airplane is, was designed uh, in multiple countries. Pieces of it are built in multiple countries. It comes together and gets, and gets put together. If you think about 
how airports have changed over time. That experience, dramatic changes uh, in, in airports. The same thing is true in healthcare. A, you know, a, a, an operating room from the 1940s and 50s, if a surgeon from that era walked in today's uh, surgical and operating rooms, they probably wouldn't know what to do with the equipment that's in there. Right? It's vast changes. Schools, on the other hand, have not changed that much uh, in terms from a facility standpoint. This is, uh, you know, years ago, obviously, and uh, one of Bexley's uh, classrooms, uh, desks primarily still arranged in rows or dedicated front to the room. There's new technology in there. There's, you know, a projector hanging from the ceiling uh, in the middle of the room, a uh, smart board on the, on the end wall. But the room is, would be pretty familiar. A teacher that was uh, in the building in 1950, if they walked into those rooms, some of them haven't changed at all, except for a little bit of different technology. So designed for a different time, a different place. Not that there's anything near necessarily exceptional about the architecture of this room, but uh, students are grouped, uh, are in groups just like you are today. There's multiple screens on the walls, allows, you know, the integration of technology into that educational experience is quite different. And the, and the experience in that room, I would argue, would be quite different as well. It's fun to kind of look at technology in terms of how it's changed over time. This is 1977. It's the Cray supercomputer. <clears throat> This was the fastest computer on the market in 1977. It cost $7.9 million. Um, before this, uh, they, the computing power of what it is, is that it's, it's the semicircular piece right in the front of the picture. The equivalent of that would have filled up, you've seen those photographs, right, with computers that fill up entire rooms, like half of this room would have been filled up with a computer, was, was packed into that guy. Right? $7.9 million. P places that could afford this would be places like Los Alamos or governmental organizations, major research institutions. Not too long later, in 2017, historic, in historical terms, terms, this is a blink of an eye. 2017, the iPhone 8 comes out. It costs $700. And it's got the same computing speed as that Cray computer. Right? So, so change is afoot uh, and, and is, is, is only accelerating. There's predictions. We've got a, a futurist friend who would tell us and has, has told us, by the year 2050, your interface with your computer won't be via keyboard. It won't be via mouse. You'll think it. The computer will do it. Now, that's actually already happening to a certain extent. Uh, Neuralink implanted a chip in, in a person's brain here not too long ago. Um, oftentimes these today are for medical reasons. Somebody has lost the use of limbs or, uh, 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 you know, they, they, can't, they can't actually physically move a mouse and so using these kind of devices to help them actually navigate in the world today. Uh, it's a little bit scary to think about this might become commonplace, right? That's, that's kind of a future I don't really want, but that's what futurists are predicting. Uh, what matters most in our increasingly innovation-driven economy is not what you know, but what you can do with what you know. When we're interviewing young architects to come work at Perkins and Will, we, you know, we look at, we look at, you know, where did you go to school? What kind of education experience did you have? But mo what we're mostly interested in is what have you done with with what you know. And the way we gauge that most often is looking at their portfolio of work. What kind of experience are you bringing to us that will be useful to us, right? So I'm a big believer in the in sort of you know what schools impart in terms of content, right? It's really really important. I always got a big kick out of this. You know, uh, if you remember when Jay Leno was on TV, and he would do these uh, sort of man on the street. He would go around asking sort kind of questions that most people should really know the answer to, like who's the vice president. And people would, you know, sort of be, I would always sort of be dumbfounded that people wouldn't know the answer to some pretty basic questions. You think, as a, as a person in a, as a citizen of the United States, this is something you actually should know the answer to, right? So the content is really important, but also what you can do with that content is increasingly important. In uh, 1892, um, it's a group of 10 scholarly, uh, white males that got together to decide the what of education. In other words, what should be taught in our schools in the, in the United States? 
And uh, it's actually still with us today. If you look at the curriculum that was put together back in 1892, it's still today. An example of that would be, and track this with me if this is, was your experience in high school. When I was a freshman in high school, I took biology. And then my sophomore year, I took chemistry. And my junior year, I took physics. I took them in that order. How many of you took those in that order in high school? A lot of us, right? These guys decided that in 1892. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with it, but you know why they decided that it should be in that order? Does anybody know? Alphabetical. Alphabetical. <laughs> right? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of schools don't teach it in that order anymore for really good reasons, but that was my experience. It's still the experience of a lot of high schoolers today. And so, but what's happening though is we're seeing a, a, a merge uh, of, of content areas. We see this in higher education. One of the uh, kind of popular building types on higher education campuses today is something called an innovation center. Amy's actually going to show you an image of one here in a bit. Innovation centers are typically not dedicated to a college. They're places that have uh, group and collaborative spaces with a lot of technology where students can come together from any, any number of colleges and, and work together collaboratively uh, on problems and projects and produce interesting results. So the way we've traditionally designed schools is here on the left. Uh, corridor down the middle, the same size classrooms marching down either side of a, of a, of a corridor. It's the way your schools primarily were designed. Right? It was for a, it was like all the students are the same, we treat them all equally. There's a teacher at the front of the classroom imparting knowledge on, uh, to the students. It gets uh, sort of uh, pulled back to us in the form of tests and other types of assessments. And the subject areas were very well defined uh, in buildings. So when I was in high school, there was a place, like a, a wing of the building where I went to take science. There was a wing where, you know, where all the English classrooms were and so forth. We're seeing a much more of a blend uh, across content areas today. So in my job, I don't like do English for an hour and then do science for an hour and then do math for an hour. It's, it all blends together, right? And so, so many schools are, are challenging the notion of those traditional departments and seeing what can we, what can we have students work on across those content areas. So there's a, there's a project, let's say, that's got a piece of math, that's got a piece of science and so forth, right? It's, it feels to the students, it feels much more real world, much more relevant. Now, from a design standpoint, what that means to us is we'd like you to have it both ways. If you want to teach traditional departmental, you can do that. If you want to move in this other direction, you can do that too, right? So to provide the, the flexibility in the school environment to allow you to do it multiple different ways, we think is a good thing. Uh, this is sort of the traditional modes, right? Uh, when I was in school, you read it, you hear it, somebody may speak it to you. If we can get students over here to the right where they're doing all of those things, but they're also experiencing it, uh, and perhaps even teaching it, right? There's a lot of power in and I'm responsible for imparting that knowledge to you. I, you know, the, the, the level of retention studies would show goes way up, right, for your students. And ultimately, that's one of the things we're after, right, uh, from, a, from a performance standpoint. Uh, this is a slide I stole from uh, Dr. Williams, a slide deck a couple weeks ago. I really liked it, but, you know, um, the kind of skills and dispositions that we're looking for today. Like when we're, that, that, that graduate that we're interviewing, these are some of the things that we're looking for. Some people call them soft skills, uh, but how creative and innovative, how, how uh, compelling of an argument can you make? Right? Can you stand up and make a pitch in front of a potential client to win a new piece of business? Um, you know, uh, all of these things are, are really uh, important. And things we're looking for in our students today as well. From a facility standpoint uh, and from a teaching and learning standpoint, we've seen uh, in the schools that we've been working with now for a number of years a bit of a shift from what uh, we're, we're noting here as a more uh, directed type of instruction or education where, it, where the sort of, it's very teacher directed, it's teacher led. The students are a bit more passive in that situation where here's what you need to learn, here's the order you're gonna learn it in, here's why you should learn it too. One that there's, is much more about student agency, right? Where there's choice and voice that the students have in their path where it's less about um, 
uh, being teacher centered is more about student student centered. Uh, perhaps moving, you know, you can read across these from this notion of this school is a place where I go to just simply consume information. It's a place where I'm actively involved in my future. I'm going there to create new ideas and perhaps new uh, uh, inventions even. And so. Uh, AI has been all the talk uh, for a couple of years now. We thought, well, let's ask ChatGPT what it thinks the top 10 characteristics of the school of the future would be. So here's what ChatGPT says. Uh, personalized learning is important. Every, every student should you know, follow their own path. The integration of technology is huge, right? It should be, uh, we should definitely be integrating technology in meaningful ways in the learning and experience. Flexible and creative spaces. Right? How many different ways can we organize uh, teaching and learning within a given space or spaces that sit adjacent to each other? It should be project-based. Students should, should work on things that feel relevant to them, relevant to their future, uh, and perhaps span those content areas that I just mentioned. There should be global awareness. Right? So students should gain an understanding of different perspectives from around the world. Right? Um, and if, which is important. Life skills and character education and sustainability. When we talked with your students in middle and high school, this was near, if not the top of their list, right? We need to be thinking about being good stewards of our resources and of, and of our environments. Uh, social emotional learning is huge. Uh, it's in growing importance today and certainly inclus and inclusive education. All the decisions that we make should be data driven, right? So. That's what ChatGPT says. Not a bad list, actually. Uh, and in a blink of an eye, it popped up on my computer screen after I prompted the question. All right. Um, we always like to talk about the, the need to think about the educational journey that you want your students to take. Before we start designing places for them to take that journey, what does that journey want to look like? What kind of work should students be doing in your schools every day? How, you know, and, and then we'll talk about, and we, we're in this process, we'll talk about the kind of space that uh, we need to wrap around those kinds of activities, okay? So that's the last slide in my section. And now it's time for you to do a little bit of work. We're gonna give you 10, 15 minutes. We'll prompt you, and we'll give you a two minute warning when it's time. Uh, but we'd like you to do, a little, you know, perhaps you spend just a few minutes thinking individually. We'd love to you and for you to engage in conversation with others at your table around this. Uh, you've got the QR codes and all the sheets. It's on the screen as well. Uh, feel free to type that stuff right into your phones. You can take the sheets with you if you want to type it in from your computer. The uh, URL is noted on the sheet if you want to rather type it into your computer later today. That, that, that site will stay open for you to be able to do that. So the next 10, 15 minutes is yours. Again, we'll prompt you. Thank you. All right, everybody. We are going to be giving you a little bit of a virtual tour of, as Steve mentioned, what's out there in the world. Just a lot of visuals coming at you. Um, but wanted to start with the guiding principles slide in just a little bit more detail because a lot of the themes that you will see today in the buildings are on this slide that was derived in the beginning of this process. And this, the Themes from the guiding principles also align with your strategic plan. So by way of example, multi-use, flexible, adaptable, uh, meeting the needs of each learner, equitable, inclusive, accessible, connected. Um, you're going to see a lot of these examples in the following slides. So here we go. Uh, these are themes that we see across our work. And again, you see a lot of these words were in your guiding principles. And we're gonna go through images that align with each of these themes. We're gonna start with flexible. So what does that mean? Um, I, it means spaces that can change, adapt quickly, um, furniture that can move, not fixing a lot of things, different spaces of different sizes. One thing I do want to address that came up last night, so I want to address it in the beginning here, is you're going to see a lot of spaces with glass, with operable walls, um, various levels of glass and transparency. And there was a question last night about safety and security and how you handle that around glass. And rest assured, uh, when these projects become building projects, that we have done this many, many different ways, and we'll find the way that's right for Bexley. 
as far as that goes. So we can solve um, the issue of safety and security and still have glass and can answer questions afterwards about how that works. But I just wanted to preface this conversation around that. So these are actually, this is an open space, a, basically a 30 foot wide space between a grade level pod of classrooms. The garage doors open into this space. The furniture in the middle is flexible. Students can break out into small groups while their teachers can still see them. Uh, this is the same space inside the classroom and that garage door here opens up in between the rooms so grade levels can gather as a team, T teachers can teach as a team, lots of different possibilities but they can also close it down and be in an acoustically private space. This is another way of doing that. This on the right side here, you'll see a movable wall that is glass so that, again, you can have that connection. You can let kids break out. These are elementary school kids into comfortable seating areas and still have eyes on them, which is great for educators to do that. We also provide little comfortable nook spaces for students who want to be in that cozy environment. Flexibility can take many forms. Again, a different way of gathering grade levels in middle school. Middle schools work in teams, typically, and this is three middle school rooms that open one into the other. All that furniture moves quickly and easily, so uh, they, can, they can get together as an entire team. Um, one thing to note about movable walls, they, the construction of movable walls has changed over the course of the years. They uh, offer acoustic privacy, and we don't typically like to put them in unless they can be operated with two fingers, whether that's a press of a button or just a real ease of movement, because otherwise they don't move. So what you're seeing here are examples of that. This might be a little bit hard to read, but I just wanted to talk about the story of this project. This is a smaller renovation project at an international school um, of a science, a STEM area. And the floor plan up here in the corner used to be just a corridor with classrooms with science labs on either side. And they wanted to kind of uh, blow up the idea of teaching and learning in this space and really work as a team. So all of these teachers, uh, have home base rooms in the blue areas where they can work quietly or work one-on-one -on -one with students. Uh, all of the area that's kind of uh, light beige color, those are open lab spaces. Uh, so that there's seven different lab areas, seven different classes that can happen at the same time. And the orange spaces are direct instruction spaces. So when, the, when uh, the educators work together as a team and they need to instruct in a quiet space, they go in there, they do their lessons, and then they all go out in the lab. So it's a super active space uh, where students can work together. Uh, there's also small group spaces, again, for those quiet learning environments when needed. So just one way that a renovation can really change a space. Whether that's the right fit for you all, don't know, but just, just an idea. Agility in furniture and choice in furniture. This is an elementary school room with lots of different ways that kids can sit and move around and work in groups. There is a small group space in between two classrooms at this elementary school where students can work with educators one-on-one -on -one in a quiet environment but still feel included in the classroom. Um, and then you'll notice just a little bit of a different level of transparency into this room from the hallway. Multifunctional is our next one. We like to say make spaces work hard. There are sometimes some spaces in school, big spaces like cafeterias that sit idle half the day or more than half the day. And so how can you, through the design of space and where you put things, locate them in a, in a way where they can not just be a cafeteria? In this school, we put the cafeteria here, kind of adjacent to the entry, adjacent to serving, adjacent to classrooms, which are off the screen. This big, um, colorful wall is their library. And it's a little bit smaller because we had space constraints and, and area and cost constraints, as, as all schools do. Um, and the cafeteria was intentionally placed outside of that library so that as soon as lunch hour was over, they could break out and use that space. So those doors swing open and stay open and it's a connected usable space for groups to gather and use as a library. On the other side, 
look in the other direction. This is also their performance space. So uh, these are small group rooms that lead into the academic area and there's a curtain that comes across there and it becomes a performance space. It's set up with lighting and acoustics for that. Another way that spaces can work hard, and this is not uncommon in uh, elementary schools, especially to have a stage adjacent to a gym. Uh, in this one, the stage is actually the cafeteria. So you don't have a stage that sits there and becomes storage 90% of the year. Um, and then this stage is actually used 99% of the time. And then sometimes it becomes a stage. There's a curtain track, so you can kind of hide all the stuff. And that's what it looks like from the other side. Another, this is a high school example. It's a black box theater. It looks just like a black box theater here. And this is a high school that didn't have a theater. And they connected it to their cafeteria, again, in a similar vein where it's used as a drama classroom black box theater all throughout the day and on occasion becomes a stage. Another saying we like to uh, use in the multi-purpose, uh, multi-use category is rethink the corridor. Uh, if you can plan a corridor or spaces that break out across a corridor in a way that maybe you just change the materiality, um, maybe you add some furniture, uh, a little bit of supervision ability, super supervisory ability from classrooms. This is an actual elementary school with actual elementary school kids working outside of the classroom together um, while being supervised. So it's not just a way to get from point A to point B. A lot of your schools, you're already using the corridors, but it's not in a way where you can maybe feel safely that you can send students out there because it's so solid. Connected is our next one. And the first thing I think about when I think about connection is technology, which you're already doing a great job here at Bexley. Um, but we want to make it easy and ubiquitous and everywhere. Um, also understanding that analog is something that we still need to do, of course. Uh, we can go as, as extreme as a 360 room where kids from, this is a, a K through 12 STEM facility, where kids from across their district can experience different environments in a 360 world. Um, but connectivity can also be uh, provided in space, renovated or new, um, via uh, maybe a connective stair or connective um, element like this, where you could use it. You could not just use it again as a circulation path. You could provide um, multi-height spaces multi with uh, some volume to it, where you can actually see things happening at different levels and um, provide thoughtful ways for students to get from point A to point B vertically. Um, we want to make sure in connection that we also provide spaces where students can either be on their own or in small groups because we all learn differently, we all work differently. So this is just a piece of furniture that's kind of a, a, a little cocoon, wonderful spot to be. This is a little window seat built in, again, if you, if you want to be on your own. And then just, again, different variety of size spaces for different groups. So this is smaller groups, but could also be individual. Steve mentioned the Innovation Center, the higher ed institutions. This is putting an example of putting learning on display, where you have a small group space where you can actually write on the glass. And these little glass cubes hover above a main circulation path, so you can actually see what's happening and inspire curiosity that way in many ways. And of course, we know this is lacking in many of your facilities, spaces for your educators and your staff to touch down, to collaborate, to work together, um, and to allow your building and your classrooms to be occupied and flexible um, throughout the day. You need to provide spaces for your faculty and staff. So these are just a few different ideas around what that could look like. And I, one last thing in this category is uh, we heard amongst um, many of the building teams uh, ideas around identity and culture. And of course, we know your mission and vision are embedded in your strategic plan. And how might that manifest itself in a building? So this building happens to be uh, have a branded element that, that our team worked on that you see throughout the building. It's a high school. And it 
Um, you see these branded uh, elements, walls across the building. But something that was interesting about this facility was it was an historic building originally, and this is a new building. And they took the ceiling uh, panels from their old building and integrated it into their cafe. So it was a way of acknowledging the history of their former facility and bringing it into the new. And another way you can embed it is really, again, just branded elements, thoughtful elements throughout that make sure you understand where you are. We'll talk a little bit about real world. Again, in building teams, a lot of um, ideas across the grade levels came up about STEM and hands-on learning and project-based and spaces to collaborate. Um, so we're going to share a few visual examples of that. This is um, high school. This is actually an advanced manufacturing lab. And really, it's just a high bay space. Um, and all of that equipment is movable. We've provided water. We've provided electricity, um, access to for large equipment through a garage door. And this can change over time. If this building is here 50 years from now and advanced manufacturing isn't happening, it could be anything. So giving that hands-on space with storage and other things associated so it can change over time. Another version of that, robotics in this one. This is in a renovated space. So again, just to show you what you can do in renovations. Uh, totally new vision here. This is, um, again, classrooms spilling out into a collaborative maker space in the center. This is another renovated space. This is an elementary school level maker space. There, is, there are power tools in that green box area, so that's, that's a decision you can make later. Another maker space, all, of, again, of the furniture and equipment is movable, just providing a space that can change over time. And of course, we know that digital creation is something that our kids are doing, um, for better or for worse, and providing intentional spaces to do that as well. There's also products of the, that project work that come out, and you want to make sure you provide ample space for um, three-dimensional and two-dimensional work, as well as digital work that comes out of your, your students. We're going to talk about sustainability, resiliency, and healthy schools to end up here. So sustainability was a huge topic that came up when we did our student workshops. Your kids are the stewards of our environment and hopefully will, will save us in the future here. Um, so there's a lot of different ways we can incorporate sustainability, but we understand it's important to your students and your community. And it's in your guiding principles. Um, resiliency is actually the ability of a building to um, bounce back, really. We talk about uh, how you can introduce resilient elements, um, such as items from the pandemic that we will now incorporate, wider corridors, spaces to break out that aren't scheduled, hand sinks, things like that that maybe weren't anticipated before as, as needed spaces in a pandemic we can incorporate now as a matter of course in the design. So all kinds of things that different parts of the country and the world experience, um, climate change or tornadoes in this part of the world, how might you plan for that? in your buildings. So sustainability doesn't have to cost more, and it's something that we want to bake in to whatever comes out of this process. Um, we just want to show some examples of, of spaces where that's been incorporated. This is a mass timber building, so you can all use materials to construct your building that are sustainable. This is a courtyard example that has a cistern, so they're gathering rainwater and reusing it. Another example of a, a student garden. Um, these are little uh, cisterns uh, just collecting drainage off of the roof. In this facility, their main circulation stair is a four-story building, had a view of the photovoltaic, the solar panels on the roof. So really just embedding the idea of sustainability even in the visuals throughout your day. And finally, healthy. And there's a lot under the category of healthy to, to share with you today. Um, this quote is from the World Health Organization. So health is really about a lot of things. And well-being is one of them. It's in your guiding principles. It's um, a lot of the points in your values from your strategic plan hit on healthy schools, school ideas. 
Students spend a lot of time in school, and so being exposed to healthy environments is really important. It's a huge part of their life as they grow up. So how might we connect to the outdoors, whether it's just through visual or through actual physical connection? Um, how might we create spaces where we learn about food and healthy food? This is that same stair you saw earlier. It's connected to the school cafeteria. It's actually their gathering space. Um, it's it's um, internal to the building, but you can see it has natural light from above as, a, as an idea. Um, and this little space off to the side here is a 400 square foot kitchen, so it can't fit a class in it, but it breaks out into this larger space and we, we put it there intentionally um, so that the community could use it for events, so that teachers could um, take their kids in there um, for a Spanish lesson and make empanadas or whatever um, might be happening. And that's what it looks like. So again, not a lot of space, but thoughtfully placed in the building so that it becomes usable for the community and for the school. Next around health and well-being, we're going to talk about inclusivity. And there's all kinds of things that fall under the umbrella of in inclusivity. Um, of course, that one of the obvious ones is accessibility, which is hugely important for this process. But we also look at universal design, which is not just accessibility, but it's around considerations about um, other um, abilities that people might have. So um, really around equitability and uh, simplicity, intuitive, and thinking about all the ways that different people might use a building. How might this be considered in K-12 education? Well, this is that same small group room you saw earlier in between the two classrooms. And this is a space where you can pull out kids who might need a quieter acoustical space, who might um, have ADHD and need, again, a quiet environment with less distraction. Um, so there are ways to uh, do that in school facilities as well. This is not a disco. This is a sensory room. All the lights are on. It's a lot. Um, typically, you wouldn't have that much stimulation in the room, but it's just an example of a space type that we're actually putting in just about every school we do today. And this is for a student who might want to use any of their senses, whether it's tactile, hearing, visual, um, to calm down or to be alone in a space. It's an, another way of acknowledging different types of learning and learning environments. Um, so again, uh, a comfortable space, but typically wouldn't have all the lights on. It's just for illustrative purposes. Um, and we want to also make sure, and we heard this from all of your schools, that our students in your crosscat rooms and in, uh, students with disabilities are um, taken care of in spaces that are equitable and appropriate um, with daylight, with accessibility in all of your facilities. Uh, Another one that first comes to mind when a lot of people think of inclusivity are around restroom functions. So we'll show you a couple of examples of what that looks like. And there's a number of ways we can do inclusive restrooms, and that's something we can talk about further as we get along this process. This is an example, again, of a renovation. So it was a typical kind of back-to-back -back, uh, plumbing, as you would see in most facilities, boys, girls, typically. And the way that we handled it here was through visibility um, it can be supervised, so pulling off what's normally a solid wall and making it transparent. Um, and making the stalls, again, you can see their full height, which is important in inclusive restrooms. And they have red and green lights, so when they're occupied, the red light turns on, so you're, you're not getting your door handle rattled and you're comfortable and you know you're in your private space. Sinks are visible, especially at elementary, that's a nice thing to have. Um, but lots of different ways we can handle inclusive restrooms. We also have a couple of different ways of, of uh, handling inclusive locker rooms. I'm not sure you all can see this, but there is a floor plan up on that upper right, which has um, two locker rooms, and there's really no difference between the locker rooms. There's no urinals in the locker rooms. There's full height changing stalls in both of the locker rooms. So. Uh, this happens to be labeled male, female, but it can be used by anyone. And there's also a private um, single user locker room as well. But there's a number of different ways you can do locker rooms. This is a community um, 
center facility. So this would be a very typical way, if you think about, if you want to wrap your head around locker rooms and sharing them, um, a very typical way that community centers do locker rooms, where there's basically restrooms that are individual, there's changing rooms that are individual, there's shower rooms that are individual, and a shared locker area. This will be, again, something that will find the right fit for Bexley when the time comes. Um, and again, to kind of wrap up around the, air, the issue of safety and security, this is also in your guiding principles. And um, what else is in your guiding principles is not just about physical safety, which is, of course, really important and in um, Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs, but also about social emotional safety and academic safety. And we can do that in facilities. Um, we can build a facility that's safe and secure. On the left side, you see how we would do that through the architecture and through the technology. But it's also people that make a school safe and having those relationships um, and operationally making sure it's staffing and policies and procedures are in place um, for safety. So ending with an example of a, a welcoming um, space where students feel a sense of belonging. This is a high school project. It's a renovation addition project. So on the right side of the screen is the, the renovated portion. On the left side is new. Um, and it is a breakout commons area with classrooms surrounding it. But they have a, a one hour lunch period for the whole school. So they can't serve everyone in the cafeteria. And they use these breakout common spaces as, as lunch areas. So they have little um, food kiosks and they're spread out throughout the facility. And that allows students who maybe don't want to be in that big cafeteria to have a space to eat lunch. It allows students to work with their clubs or the groups that they like, and allows students to be with their friends at lunch. So another way um, space can help that. And we also wanted to share an idea of where you might eat besides a cafeteria, just because we know a lot of your cafeterias have um, some space constraints. And Steve's going to tell a little story. Great. Thanks, Amy. So in the late 1800s, if you wanted to have an image captured of you and your family, you'd go to see one of these guys, right? A photographer. And the reason you had to do that was because uh, of the equipment. Only a few people had this piece of equipment, right? It's the, it's the little box sitting on top of the tripod. He'd throw a dark cover over his head. You'd have to hold still for a long time. You know those late 1800s photographs where everybody's like deadpan, like, don't you smile? They couldn't, right? Because they had to hold that for a long period of time so they could set the exposure. Um, not too long after that, though, this is in the 1890s, Kodak developed this little camera that you see depicted right here in this illustration. And what Kodak would do would be they would load film into the camera for you, give it to you, and then you could take it home or wherever you wanted to and, and take some pictures. You take the entire camera back to, to, to Kodak, they would pull the film out, develop the film, and give you your pictures. Right? When I was a kid, uh, so that's all Kodak. Uh, when I was a kid, I, this was my camera. Uh, some of you may in the room may be old enough to remember this camera if you had one of these. It was a little plastic-bodied camera. If I snapped a picture, it had a, a, a four-position a four bulb on the top. It would rotate one quarter. You're shaking your head. You remember this. It would rotate one quarter turn. This was advanced technology when I was a kid. It was plastic-bodied, though. Um, it wasn't, the, it wasn't actually not a very good camera when you when when came right down to it, but it always had Kodak film inside of it. Like I would go to my local dime store. Now again, I'm dating myself because I just said dime store, right? I go to my dime store, I'd pick up, see the people who are old enough in here to understand that laugh, right? So, th so thank you. Uh, I put the camera, put the film in the camera. I would put the film in the camera. I would take the film back out, take it back to the dime store. They would develop it for me and I'd get my, my photographs, right? Um, in 17, 17, 1977, this gentleman, his name is Steve Sessons, uh, a Kodak employee invented this thing he's got hoisted up onto his shoulder. So this is a quick quiz, what is that thing he's got up on his shoulder? Again, he works for Kodak, so any guesses? A photo printer? A, a slide projector? Nope, it's none of those. A Polaroid, uh, that's a pretty good guess, like the first Polaroid, yeah, but that's still not right. I see, what's that? It is 
the first digital camera. It weighed eight pounds, right? Uh, this thing on the right next to his right ear, you might be able to just make that out. That's a, um, a cassette, a, a tape cassette that we used to, you know, used to put it in your dashboard, you know, when I was a kid, you know, put in, you know, Van Halen, you know, again, I'm dating myself, all right, to listen, you know, sort of rock and roll when I was driving around when I was a teenager. But that's what would record the digital image onto that tape cassette. So this is sort of uh, a kind of a rigged thing that, that he invented. You know, it's got, it's got, you know, there's the lens right there. It would capture one-tenth of one megapixel. I'm not quite sure what, how many megapixels my iPhone is, but it's, it's a lot, right? It's really good quality. Um, so first digital camera. What do you think Kodak did with that first digital camera? What's that? Yeah, kind of, yeah, they, they, that's actually a good guess. They stuck it on a shelf, right? And, and the reason for that was Kodak really was fundamentally not in the camera business. They were in the film business, right? If you looked at any of the professional photographers at that time, and maybe even still now, you know, Kodak film was the film of choice. I always had Kodak film in my cameras when I was a little kid. Um, and so they put it on, they put it on the shelf, and uh, at some point in history, I forget what year it was, Kodak filed for bankruptcy, right? They really did not see what was coming in front of them. And so, just a little story to get, really to get to this slide, which is not advancing now, but I'll do this. Um, just a little prompt before you get into your next session to think about, right? We, while, while there's things that are in our past that are really important, and this is very true in schools, there's things that you do in schools today that are super successful, you should certainly drag those things forward into the future, but there might be some things that, you know, maybe we should be leaving behind. But, our, but the questions here, like, are we, are we designing, are we planning for our past or our children's future? So just again, to try to get the mindset into the future, we do need to be thinking about what is on the, what's in front of us today, but we certainly want to be setting you up for success in the future, okay? So at this point, we're going to break into, I'll handle your question in a moment, if you can. Uh, break into uh, the groups again. The, I don't know if it's my battery, what it is here. The, you've got your sheets with the two questions, the second two questions uh, are on here. Uh, how might our school's physical environments be better designed to support future learning? And what additional information would be helpful during the options phase for our, district's, uh, our district facilities planning process? Again, we're about to jump into the options phase where all the work, all the data that's been collected so far is going to begin to inform options that you know, we'll, be, we'll be bringing back out to the community for your thoughts and evaluations, okay? So, Go into your groups if you would, just like before. Love the energy before. I'll come back and get your question answered. All right. If you've made it this far, thank you. We're going to stick around a little bit later if you have any more questions. Um, but as treasurer, I evaluate some things uh, financially, and I want to recognize and thank you for three things. One, your time. I know that's hard to put a price tag on it. Maybe you can. I can sometimes. Um, your mind. Thank you for sharing your mind and your thoughts this morning. And I know it's not easy to sit in a chair for three hours or an hour and a half, but uh, thank you for uh, staying present with us this morning. Up on the screen, you'll see our next steps. Our next community engagement session is on May 21st and 22nd. Before for that, we've got our building teams. Uh, again, go to our website if you have additional feedback uh, later on in between now and then. Thank you.